And it's like you're a laser focused man. You can pay attention forever. You can work until you're exhausted. You won't even notice it. And you remember everything. It's like, okay, if you can't control your interest, what does? Here's another thing that made me a really an advocate of psychoanalytic thinking. And it, it, it was the sort of thing that started to terrify me about what the human psyche was actually like. I started to understand that not only were we like an amalgam of, of relatively autonomous sub-personalities, each of which had the possibility of gaining control, but that we were also victim, you might say, or beneficiary of impulses that were beyond our conscious formulation or, or, or understanding or capacity to resist. So, one, here's, a, here's a funny story. So, I was talking to one of my Patreon people online this week and he said, He's a, he was a committed atheist, and that's fine, you know, lots of atheists are very honest people, and they're atheists because they don't know how to reconcile what they know with traditional claims, let's say, and they're not willing to just mangle them together, you know. And there might be cynicism, all that associated with it as well, but he said he was, he said he was entranced by these biblical lectures, you know, which is pretty weird. And he said if someone would have told him a year ago that he was going to like be obsessed with a sequence of biblical lectures, he would have told them that they were mad. And so we had a bit of a discussion about that, because this is an interesting thing, you know. And he, he mentioned this, he said, it was something like, you don't choose your interests, they choose you. And that's really worth thinking about too, man, because, you know, it's really hard to get interested in something you're not interested in, even if you know there's a good reason for it. You know, you're studying for an exam, you find the material boring, you know, anything will be more interesting than, than the studying. Even though you know that that's what you need to do, you can't voluntarily grab yourself by the scruff of the neck, let's say, and shake yourself and say, sit down and concentrate. Your mind will just go everywhere. But then if you're interested in something, and even if it's something you shouldn't be interested in, because that happens all the time, then it's like you're a laser focused man. You can pay attention forever. You can work until you're exhausted. You won't even notice it. And you remember everything. It's like, okay, if you can't control your interest, what does? And man, I tell you, you can think about that for a very long time. So Jung talked about the spirit Mercurius. You know, Mercury is the winged messenger of the gods. And, and here's how he conceptualized it psychologically. He thought this is what the, the ancient people who thought about Mercury as the winged messenger of the gods were trying to state psychologically. You know, your, your interest flits around. It's like there's something that captures it and that moves your interest from place to place. You know, like if you walk into a bookstore, you'll get interested in a particular book. And it's as if the book grips you. Because you don't know why you're interested in that. You might, but often you don't know why you're interested in that book. And, you know, your interest is flitting around. And so that's Mercury. The thing that makes your interest flick, flicker around is Mercury, the winged messenger of the gods. And Mercury is the messenger of the gods because it's the things behind the scenes psychologically that are manipulating your attention. And for Jung, those were equivalent in some sense to the lost gods. And so for Jung, your, your interest was being manipulated behind the scenes by unseen forces that were associated with your characterological development across time. That was the manifestation of the self. So the self is this, the, the potential you, let's say. And the way it operates in the present is by gripping your interest and directing it somewhere. And that's part of the instinct of self-realization. It's a mind-boggling idea, man, really. It's, I think it's correct. I, I can't see how it can't be correct. It doesn't mean I understand it completely, but it certainly seems phenomenologically correct. And, I mean, the potential that you are has to manifest itself somehow in, in the here and now. It has to. And what better way than by directing your attention? You know, it's like, it seems like this might be useful for you. Maybe you get attracted to this person. Maybe you admire this person. That happens with kids a lot. They'll admire someone and then copy them. And you can see that that's obviously part of their developmental progression, right? It's a form of hero worship, but kids are very imitative and they hero worship at the drop of a hat. And so they're, they're entranced by the, the next stage of development. And if they see someone who embodies that, especially if it's in the zone of proximal development, it's, it's, some, it's something they could achieve, stretching a bit. They find someone who embodies that next stage of development and then they start to I imitate them and act like them. Well, we're, adults are no different. We're no different. We're just, we do it at a perhaps more abstract and sophisticated level.